All right. So obviously we're here, we're celebrating our one year anniversary as a church. And as I was mentioned briefly in announcements, you know, we've got a lot of things that have happened over the course of the year. We started off meeting in the um, in Norcross, but over at the Lucky Shoals Park in the community room, just renting out a room over there. And uh, until we were able to finally establish this location, we've only been here for, I don't know, about six months now. And a lot of things have happened. And I just want to emphasize that None of this could have happened first and foremost without God blessing us and, and bringing everybody together. That our church is, you know, the church is the body of Christ. And each local independent church is a body. We're a congregation, we're a body. Christ is at the head, and we are all members. And the only reason why this church is succeeding in the fashion that it is is because we have so many members that are in various roles, filling jobs, doing things, and working for the church, being ministers and ministering within the church. That's what it's all about. We don't come here just to be, give, you know, give me, give me, give me everything you got and not giving to others. The, the whole point of, of ministry is service. It's, it's exactly that. It's a service. It's a ministry. We should be going to help others. We all have different jobs. Obviously, the role that I'm filling within this church is one of an overseer and also to help teach and to guide and instruct and lead. But the church is not just Pastor Burson's. The church is everybody, and we have a lot of people. Here's what I love about this church is how many people are willing to give of themselves who are take initiative to just do stuff because we need people to just step up and do work. We, we've, in the past year, been able, now we have got a nursing home ministry. We're going to be starting up a prison ministry soon. Um, a lot of things have been happening. I've got our, our numbers here for the year. So since the church was established, there was 867 salvations that we've recorded as a church. Praise God for that. And I, I'm, after seeing that number year to date where we are right now, I'm thinking we need to up our goal right. for the end of the year. So next week I'll be giving you our new and improved goal for where we want to reach and the mark we're trying to press for for the end of the year. Because we want, we want the goal to be something where we're pushing ourselves for. Just like this month, we're pushing ourselves to, to try to give the gospel to people. Let's push ourselves for the end of the year and hopefully be pushing ourselves, not just personally, because there's only so much work any one individual can do. We also want to focus on getting other people discipled and out soul winning. We want to get new people out knocking on doors, preaching the gospel of Jesus Christ that haven't done it before. That's the only way we're going to continue to reach more and more because... We're all going to be maxed out at some point on how much time you can actually spend, you know, giving the gospel. Which is why we need to try to work on doing all the things. Following through with people. Get, you know, trying to, trying to get more people plugged into church. Whether you got them saved or not, just, just trying to get other people, you know, in the church. Get them established so that we as a group can do even more. Reach more people. Win the loss of Christ. That's, that is the lifeblood of our church. And what we see here in Philippians chapter 3, look at, first of all, just look at verse number 1. The Bible says, Finally, my brethren, rejoice in the Lord to write the same things to you. To me, indeed, is not grievous, but for you it is safe. And he goes on to warn them, but just this concept of just saying, you know what, I'm going to write the same thing unto you. And it doesn't, it's not grievous, it doesn't sadden me. And what I'm going to be preaching on this morning, just a subject I'm recovering, it's going to be something that you've probably heard already before. And you know what, there's a lot of sermons like that. And so, you know, hopefully you're getting some new stuff out of different sermons and things that preach. But it doesn't bother me to go over stuff that we've heard before because it's needful, it's necessary. We need to be reminded of things on a regular basis. And what we preach on this morning is just continually improving your soul winning. I figure it's a very good topic to cover since we've been here for a year. This is what the main emphasis of the church is, is going out and, re and preaching the gospel to the lost. 
We ought to be continually evaluating our own soul winning efforts in trying to lead people to Christ and how we can improve on that. Now, I've been out knocking doors since 2006. And I've been an active speaker trying to do that since 2007. I didn't actually start really giving the gospel to people until 2007. So I hope that you can at least you know, consider that, that I've been doing this for 12 years consistently, week after week, going out and preaching the gospel to people. And I've gained some wisdom over the past, over a decade in my experience, in teaching and training other people, in preaching the gospel, so that when I provide some tips today, it's not just on a whim. It's not just, well, I just think this. This comes with a lot of experience. And I, to this day, am continually self-analyzing every time I'm giving a go. What is there something else I could have done? Is there something else I could have said? Did I do this right? Did I do that right? Is there another verse I could have used? Am I taking too long? Am I going too quick? Right. This is an attitude that hopefully you have as well with your own soul winning, because we ought to always want to be improving continually improving. I'm not here, even though I just said, hey, I've got 12 years experience. I'm not telling you that I'm the perfect soul winner. I'm not. There are times I make mistakes and, I know, and I'm always trying to improve. But it's not that I'm, I'm also not just a newbie. I'm not just a beginner at this either. I've been doing this for a long time and I've, I've experienced a lot of things along the way. Look at verse number 13. Again, this is the attitude that the apostle Paul has, he says, brethren, I count not myself to have apprehended. So he's like, I'm not saying I've arrived. I'm not not considering just myself to, oh yeah, I've already apprehended, I'm I'm good to go. He says, no, I count not myself to have apprehended, but this one thing I do, forgetting those things which are behind and reaching forth unto those things which are before, I press toward the mark for the prize of the high calling of God in Christ Jesus. Let's have that attitude. Let's press towards that mark. Let's keep on trying to improve, do better, do more. What else can I do? And to, and to have our eyes focused on the price. Let's not wor- worry about failings, worry about time. You know, you've screwed up. Let's learn from that, but move forward. Amen. You know, you fail at something, let's move forward. As I was saying, even with the challenge this month, like, oh, I failed, you know, I missed a day. You know what? Forget about that. Just keep on trying to at least work out the rest of the month and, and, and finish out the month strong. Because, you know what? The pro- whatever prize you're going to get, which I don't even know what it is yet, whatever prize you're going to get, of course, right? I, I'm not the best with prizes here. Whatever prize you're going to get from Strong Old Baptist Church for doing any of our challenges or any of these things is nothing compared to the rewards that God's going to give you anyways. So you say, oh, well, I'm not going to get the reward from, from Strong Old Baptist so what? Go out and preach the gospel to someone because God's rewards are going to be way better anyways. Amen. Way better. So, so just think about that and don't worry about whatever little gift you're going to get from us. Um, that's just, it's really just symbolic of what, of what God and Jesus are going to you know, give you for doing the work that you do. So uh, keep that in mind and keep that spirit in mind. So all of that being said, I'm going to just, we're not going to be turning to a whole lot of scripture. You can turn to Titus chapter 3. We're going to go there in, in a little bit. But I really just want to try to give you some, some real good practical advice to help you in your preaching of the gospel to people when you just go out door to door and things like that. And the number one thing I want to emphasize this morning is being thorough. Being thorough with your presentation of the gospel. One thing, if, if we're going to err on one side or the other of just being real quick and getting to as many people, because look, we want to reach as many people as we can. We do. Amen. We want to get to as many people as we can and, and bring in the biggest harvest that we can. Absolutely. But we also want to make sure that we are doing a good job with every single individual soul that we come into contact with. And if we're going to err on one side or the other, I'd rather have you err a little bit on the side of maybe being too thorough than being too hasty. Because on the one side, if you're too thorough, if they're getting it and if they're picking it up and they get saved, amen. 
But if you're too hasty and you don't realize they never really got it, they're not saved. I mean, and, and the whole point is their salvation, right? So be thorough and, and, you know, if you're new to this or whatever, come on out with us. And, and, and let me just state this too because I'm going to bring up a lot of tips, but I've gone out soul winning, I think, with, with all of the regular members of our church here that go out soul winning. And everyone's doing a really good job. Let me say that. I'm really pleased and confident in sending people out here that are going out soul winning because I've heard the presentation and you guys are doing good, a really good job. So don't, I'm, I'm, I don't want this to be perceived as throwing a wet blanket on anything that you're doing at all because it's really exciting. There's a lot of good work being done. Okay, so don't, don't take it that way. The whole purpose is just to self-analyze and look at yourself and, uh, and see if there's any area you can do better on. And the reason why I want to emphasize being thorough, though, is because sometimes, and especially with people who are newer at, at soul winning, I mean, even, even if you've been going soul winning for a whole year, this is something that I've experienced personally and I've seen with other people. I was talking to a few guys last week about it, um, or yesterday or whenever, well, I don't remember what day it was, Wednesday night maybe, about this very thing. And just as we, you know, everybody grows. When I first got saved, let me use this analogy first. When I first got saved, salvation is so simple, right? Believe on the Lord Jesus Christ and thou shalt be saved. And when I decided just to put my trust in Jesus Christ, right? It, it was obviously a big moment for me. But it's so simple. And when you just say, wow, I, I believe this. I knew I was saved. I was excited. And in my mind, I'm thinking like, well, I just kind of joined this club of Christianity now because I'm a Christian, you know, I, I grew up in a Christian home before, but no, now I really believe this. Now this is, you know, now I'm saved. And because I didn't really know a whole lot, I thought that, hey, the, you know, the, the Presbyterians and Methodists and Pentecostals and just all, just all these branches of Christianity that they were all saved too. That I'm just another... Christian among all these other groups. I just didn't understand salvation before, but now I do, and now I'm saved. And I had this mindset of just thinking that, well, they're all, everybody's saved because they're all claiming the name of Christ. But that's not true. And it took a little while to realize that. But the reason why that's not true, for any of you might wondering, like, wait, that's not true? It's because they don't believe the same gospel. They don't believe that they don't all believe that salvation is not of works. In fact, the vast majority of those I just mentioned will say, no, you, I mean, you, you, can't, you can't just believe. I mean, you've you got you to gotta at least try to follow the law. you got to at least try to do something good. you at least try to do these things. And, and they'll tell you, well, no, I mean, well, hey, if you're sinning willfully, I mean, no, you can't be saved then. And they have all these different caveats to salvation, which ultimately they don't believe in eternal life. They don't believe that it actually is all done and paid for by Jesus Christ. That you still have to do more. And that's why they're not saved. It's not because I don't like them. It's not because they disagree on other doctrines. It's because they don't believe the gospel. Amen. But as a young babe in Christ, I didn't understand that. Because I didn't know what they all believed. I didn't know any stuff. I was just thinking, man, I'm a Christian now. And you could just kind of go wherever and pick and choose. Now, thankfully, I was guided into uh, a good, you know, Baptist, you know, independent Baptist type doctrine. Of just, I, I would call it biblical doctrine. But was directed towards churches and a mindset that are following the Bible the most closely. And, um, you know, grew from there. Now, why am I going into this example? Well, the reason why is because similarly... As a babe in Christ, man, you know, I didn't understand this stuff. I had to learn more and kind of grow more and understand more about why not everybody that says that they're a Christian is actually saved and a Christian. When we go out soul winning, oftentimes people who are newer to soul winning will have a tendency to think that people are getting saved that aren't really getting saved. And this is a big you know, area where I think we need to make sure that we're pretty good at and we try to focus on and 
Some of this is just going to come with growth and experience. But hey, we've been here for a year. And I know, I know there's many people who have been sewing for longer than this church existed. And praise God for that. But hey, these tips are helpful for everybody. Okay. So um, the number one thing I want to make sure everybody's doing is, is making sure that the person understands the gospel. Because... It, it, and let me put it this way. If, if you're going out soul winning and every single time you go out soul winning, you have just multiple people getting saved, you're probably doing something wrong. And again, I'm not trying to throw a wet blanket on it, but just from my experience in going out soul winning and what I've seen and what I've done myself in years past when I was newer at soul winning, when I wasn't very good at maybe looking at the person and talking to the person I'm talking to because what I, what, when, and let me explain it this way, okay, when I start soul winning, there's a lot of nervousness, you want to go out, you want to preach the gospel, and yes, go out and preach the gospel, but I had, a, I was focused more on me making sure I'm hitting all the points I'm supposed to hit, making sure I'm going to the right verses, making sure, so a lot of the focus is I want to make sure I'm getting this right. Now, I'm not saying that, well, nobody I gave the gospel to got saved, of course not. But I wasn't able to really focus on the other person as much. And what I was doing was more preaching at the person than preaching to the person and engaging them in more conversation. So it's one thing to have a script and just get up and say, well, this is how you get saved. And you go blah, 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 you know, and go through the whole list. And you know what? Some people might get that. And praise the Lord. And that's why we want people, no matter where you are at in your spiritual growth and in your knowledge, if you're saved, hey, get out soul winning and just and start learning and start getting experience and start going because at the end of the day, it's still the power of God that's going to get people saved. But at the same token, we want to be aware of the people we're talking to and a lot of people have a tendency to just agree with you on things, even though they might not fully comprehend what you're saying. Because a lot of people have heard, well, salvation is by grace through faith. Salvation is by grace alone. These are, these are you know, catchphrases. I mean, they're biblical, right? Absolutely. But these are, these are phrases that people have heard over and over again because the work salvation crowd, they'll say all this stuff. But it's the understanding that people need to have. You have to understand the gospel in order to believe it. You could hear the gospel and not understand it, and that's not going to do you any good. You need to have the understanding. And look, it's not this perfect understanding of everything from Genesis to Revelation. The gospel itself is very simple and very plain. Jesus died on the cross as the Son of God, God incarnate, bearing our sins. Yep. He was buried. He rose again from the dead after three days and three nights and conquered death and hell and he paid the punishment that we deserve to pay for our sins. He's offering eternal life as a free gift. All we have to do to receive it is to receive it. And the only way we can receive that gift is by putting our trust, our faith, believe on Jesus Christ. Simple concept. And I know, look, you guys understand this, but this is how simple it is, right? It's easy to, to do that. However, as easy as it is, some people still don't get it. And they may hear the words that you say and go, yeah, sure but they don't quite understand what you're saying. Because, again, if you're using words that, that uh, they've heard before, they've heard it in church, sure. This is why being thorough, in, in our effort to be thorough, we don't just, you know, you, you need to make sure the understanding is there, and the only way you can do that is by engaging in conversation with the person. It's the same concept that, you know, do I think people could be saved just by coming to church? If there's a salvation message, they could hear the gospel. Yes, they can. They can hear the gospel just through preaching and understanding and get saved. However, that doesn't happen very often. Right. 
And again, it, just through my own experience, because I've always made it a point personally, and I'd like that to be the same case here when visitors come into church, we ask all of our visitors, do you know for sure if you die today, you're going to heaven? We ask them about their salvation because it's so important. And I've had people come into church when I was attending church before I was a pastor, and the entire sermon was like about eternal security. I mean, it is a salvation sermon. There is just point after point after point. And I'm just thinking like, well, surely this person, if they're not saved, would have understood and, and just, you know, what more can I possibly say after a sermon like that? But I still approach a person. Do you know for sure? Nope. Nope. Don't know. And this isn't just one time that I'm recollecting. This has happened time after time after time. Just showing you need to have that conversation. You need to interact with that person. Because while if you just preach at them, some people will understand that, but not everybody will. We need to have the interaction, which is digging just deep enough to understand what is it really in their heart. And one of the best ways to uncover what, a, you know, because it's one thing to say, well, I agree, salvation is by grace through faith. You can walk away and just say, well, that person saved then. But that wouldn't be very thorough. One of the ways that you understand what the person is actually trusting in is by asking questions. So we don't want to just go out and just preach at people. We want to preach the gospel to them, but engage them. Talk, get the conversation going, and start asking. Well, in order to understand what you're saying, you need to give examples. You need to ask them, well, what if a person were to, you know, what if a person were to believe in Jesus, but then they went out and killed somebody? I mean, would that person be saved? Now you're, 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 you're starting to bring the concepts together to understand what is in that person's heart. Because a minute ago they might have just said, well, yeah, salvation is just by believing. But you bring a situation like that and just ask about that. Well, well, I don't know. I mean, I mean, you can't just kill somebody so that person would go to hell. I mean, how many times have you heard that answer? Right. Well, when someone keeps an answer, you know what? They might have just agreed with you that salvation is only by, by believing. But that's not really what they're trusting in. They're trusting in a works-based salvation because they'll say, yes, you have to believe, but you also have, I mean, you can't just, you can't just break the law like that. I mean, you can't just kill somebody. Now, usually people, they don't have their faith really pinned down. But the answer that they give you is coming out of their heart. So we want to be careful enough to ask people some specific questions to make sure that they're believing right. Now, we also don't want to beat a dead horse, as it were. Right? I mean, if someone gets it, and if you think, like, because we cover various points. First, we have to cover that, that first of all, they're a sinner, right? Because how else, why else would someone even need a savior if they don't believe that they're a sinner that, that deserves hell? Once you get that established, we don't need to just keep on going on and on and on about how horrible they are. This is, and this is the method of like the Ray Comforts, right? The repent of your sins crowd. They focus so much on how horrible of a sinner you are. But honestly, the, the majority of people that we talk to, first of all, 99 more 9% of people are going to recognize I'm a sinner. It's almost nobody that says, nope, I don't do anything wrong. Nope, I'm not. I, I, Come across it, but it's almost everybody that will just admit, yeah, I've done wrong. Now, not everybody's going to understand that that sin is worthy of a punishment in hell. Just like I used to think when I was young and growing up, I was like, well, of course I'm not perfect. But I mean, I haven't done anything that bad. I mean, yeah, I've lied, yeah, I've done this, but you know, I haven't done anything that bad. So yeah, I'd probably go to heaven. A lot of people have that attitude. So, we show them verses that say, hey, you know what I mean? Revelation 21.8 is a great place to show people. Even lying is enough to get you there. But if a person can look at that and say, yeah, so, so do you see how like even, you know, even in, in our eyes, we might think it's a big deal, but in God's eyes it is, and God's punishment is hell. 
Do you believe that? Yeah, I guess so. All right, move on. Don't just, just keep going on and on and on. Now, you may have to keep going on if the person still doesn't get it, if they don't accept it. What we need to do, and this is part of being thorough, spend as much time as you need to with each point. So what I, with each person I talk to, I am willing to invest as much time as necessary with that person. We don't want to rush it just to get to the next person. Hey, treat that person. That soul is extremely valuable in the sight of God. So whatever it is, however much time I need to spend is what I'll do for that person. But I also don't want to waste my time when I could also be reaching other people. So there's a balance here, and I'm not going to be able to pinpoint every single way to do this because some of this is going to come with experience. But what I'm saying and what I want to emphasize is the thoroughness and err on the side of thoroughness because we want to make sure that the per- whoever you speak to understands the gospel. That is critical. So you, you make sure they understand they're a sinner. Move on to the gift. Move on to what God did for us. Don't just leave them hanging with the bad news, right? Let's show them the good news. Explain the gospel to them. Now, because we live in a, in a Christian culture, or, you know, people have a Christian background, thankfully... Most people have heard of the death, burial, and resurrection of Jesus Christ. Most people actually even believe that Jesus Christ was God in the flesh. Important points. We need to go over that. You should bring it up. I typically will ask people those questions without even going to all the scriptures proving that. Because it's so common knowledge, if people have already received that truth, I'm not going to continue to go through all, you know, just a to to show scripture on everything and just add that to the presentation of taking up the time. Now look, of course it's extremely important, but just because I know so many people have that knowledge already and they believe that, you know, as far as just the the events that have happened and, and, you know, kind of who Jesus is, great, I'll move on. But if they don't believe that Jesus Christ is is God in the flesh, I'm going to park it. And then we're going to start turning to verses. If they don't, if they've never heard of the resurrection of Christ. Well, you know what? That's a really good time now to show them from Scripture that, yes, he died according to the Scriptures and, you know, rose again from the dead according to the Scriptures. So let, let's show them that when needed. But, you know, some of these things obviously um, are more necessary to show from Scripture than others just based on the person's current state, what they believe. Continue going through and... Um, Again, you apply the same method of making sure from point to point, are they getting it? Do they understand what I'm saying? By engaging and asking questions so that, so that anybody can nod and say, okay, uh-huh, uh-huh. Ask the questions along the way and, and keep them engaged. Because also, if you're just doing all the talking like I am right now, there's going to be people in this room probably right now who's just daydreaming. <laughs> And maybe have been for the past few minutes. Like, what? Oh. And, and now everyone's paying attention. See? I've got everyone's attention. But as you speak, and look, I sit in the pew sometimes too. You have thoughts that come into your mind and just distract you from what's going on. And even in personal conversation, sometimes you, you just drift off. Something else catches your attention. So when you're more engaged in a conversation, it's a lot less likely to be just thinking about other things. So when you engage a person, look, you know what you're saying is very important. You know this is, I mean, this is heaven and hell that you're talking with this person. They don't always get that. They could have other things going on. They could be busy. They could be thinking about the rest of their day. And if you're just talk, 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 again, it doesn't mean they can't get it, but try to just remember that for yourself and keep them engaged. Keep them active in the conversation. Make it a conversation, not just a one-way, well, you're just going to have to listen to what I have to say because it's going to be a lot less likely for them to receive it because it's easier for them to get distracted and not get it. So um, focus on that. Make it, it should be a natural conversation. It really should. There's a direction to it. You have a plan. 
You know what areas you need to cover in order to, to make sure they understand the gospel. You know what verses. You should know what verses you're going to turn to and what you want to show them. You are leading the conversation, yet it's still a conversation. Right. Allow the person to speak, to talk, hear what they have to say, and communicate with them as you're leading. And you know what? Sometimes people are going to want to go off onto a rabbit trail. And, well, what do you think about this? What do you think about that? And they'll ask you about, you know, a lot of times homosexuality. Or they'll ask you about aliens. Or they'll ask you about whatever, right? Just all these different things. Try to stay on course. The most important thing, the reason why we're there is to preach the gospel to them. And we don't need to be rude to people or anything like that. And people are asking, usually they have genuine questions about stuff. But instead of just answering every question that they have, I just had this the other day. I was talking to some guy, and he just wanted to talk about evolution. He wanted to talk about this and that. And, you know, you can give maybe a real quick answer. But one of the best things to do is say, like, you know what, we could talk about that a little bit later. And just, uh, just one more point on the evolution thing. Evolution is something that I've actually studied a lot on. The Christian science side and the other side. And, and understand a lot about evolutionary science. And that's something I used to hold to. So for me personally, I can have a very intelligent conversation with somebody about evolution. But, and so for me, the temptation to get in on that rabbit trail is easy because, oh man, I could just show them how this is wrong and this is wrong and just, just, just let them understand the science on this. And I've done that before and it never works. Right. I have never led anyone to Christ by proving to them that evolution is false. Right. Never once. I have, had, I have led people to Christ by not going down that path, giving them the gospel... And then go back to that and say, well, and here's why. Because once you receive the gospel, once you receive the Bible, it's true. Well, now you're a lot more open anyways to hear the reasons behind it. Most people, when they ask these evolution questions, they're just stuck on, well, science is fact. We need to just show them the gospel. Jesus Christ, you know, do you believe that Jesus Christ came, died for your sins, paid for on the cross, you know, Get them to understand that. The rest of it you can you can deal with later. So um, stick to the gospel. Don't go down these rabbit trails. They'll end up being a waste of your time. You may think like, oh well, if I can just answer all their questions, they'll finally hear me out. Don't take that approach. You'll just end up wasting all of your day trying to answer every question. And you know what? You probably won't be able to answer every question that someone might throw at you. Don't worry about it. You don't have to answer every single question that they have about the Bible. Hey, if they want to learn all this stuff about the Bible, tell them to come to church. These topics are all preached on. But what the important thing is, the reason why you're there is they need to hear the gospel. So keep it ba uh, balanced on that. And what I usually like to tell people is, hey, we can talk about that in a little bit. You know, I'd, be, I'd be happy to answer your questions. But I just can we just get back to what I was showing you about this? Can we get back to that and just try to give them the gospel? Because that's going to be the power of God and the salvation for the people that you're talking to. The Bible says in Titus chapter 3, it's where you turn, right? Look at verse number 9. The Bible says, but avoid foolish questions. So when we're giving the gospel, we want to avoid foolish questions. You know, there are a lot of stupid questions that people will ask. And we want to just try to avoid that. Avoid foolish questions and genealogies and contentions and strivings about the law. You know, people just want to fight with you about, well, the law says this. And, you know, again, there's a, usually the sodomy thing. And, well, I don't think that people should, you know, we don't need to get in some fight with them about God's law. Let's avoid that. It says here they're unprofitable and vain. And ultimately, it's vanity. And, and you, this is something we need to check ourselves with because the more knowledge that you get, you might feel like, like I was just saying with evolution, like, oh man, I could show this person. I could run circles around. You know, I could just give them all stuff. It's just going to be vanity. It's vain. I could win arguments with people, uh, with Mormons and Jehovah's Witnesses or whatever, and just, man, I know my Bible, and I will just you know, run laps around them. 
with all my Bible knowledge. You know, it doesn't do you any good at all Amen. to win an argument if you can't reach them with the gospel. We don't need to just, just win arguments with people. We're not out trying to argue. We're just trying to persuade people to believe on the Lord Jesus Christ. That's the goal. Don't ever forget that. Verse number 10 there, a man that is an heretic after the first and second admonition, reject, knowing that he that is such is subverted and sinneth being condemned of himself. So we run into these people that are heretics. Do we care about them? Yeah. Do we want them to get saved? Yeah. But are we going to spend all day with them? No. You say, well, Pastor Burton, didn't you just say spend as much time as necessary, Burton? Yes. But there are people out there that if they're not receiving what you're saying after two times of giving them proof, give, showing them some scripture, hey, look at this, look at this, and they're just not receiving it, then the Bible's saying, just reject them. Right. Move on. Amen. You got one chance, you got two chances. If people aren't in a state of mind to receive what you're saying, it's time to just cut it and go. Amen. Yeah. That's different from the person who is willing to engage, is actually willing to hear and to listen and to hear out what you have to say, right. that person I'll spend as much time as I need to with. Amen. Because they're open to hearing the gospel. If someone's just like, no, no, this is, you know, I'm Catholic and this is the way it is and I'll show you. And people try to teach you at their door when you're trying to show them, move on. Right, right. Just move on. Cut your time there. Move on to the next house. Move on to the next door. And it's, and it's a careful balance, but it's going to come with experience. But all, these are all things that you should be asking yourself when you go out soul winning you know, and analyzing. Did I spend too much time at the door? And look, I'm guilty of this. I spend too much time at the door with people sometimes. Right. I am guilty of that. Right. I can do better at that. That's one of my flaws. But part of the reason for that is because I, don't, I, 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 I still would rather err on that side than just being too hasty with people, and that's that's kind of the decision that, that I've made in my life, and I want to just get to um, as long as people have had their opportunity, then then we're good. But you know, for me, an area I need to improve on is that I need to probably cut it short a little bit sooner. Um, all of the points of the gospel are important. Every point is important. Some people need more emphasis on some areas more than others. Some people don't even believe in hell. So you need to spend a lot of time on that. Some people believe, you know, all different beliefs. But eternal life is the one that I think will always demand the most attention in the, in the society we live in today. Because that contains the essence of salvation. Like that, that, that contains the gospel itself. The understanding of eternal life. One must understand eternal life to be saved. If you don't understand the concept that it lasts forever, you're not saved. If you don't understand that it's truly been done and paid for and bought and, and everything else, you cannot be saved. First John chapter five. This is this is one of the places I love to, to show people to prove this one point. Because you'll talk to people and say, you know what? But I believe in the death, burial, and resurrection of Christ. So why am I not saved? You know, why do you think I'm not saved? I believe it's by grace through faith. Well, if you don't believe that it actually lasts forever, that it's eternal, the alternative is just, well, then how could you lose it? How could it be taken away? How? And if it's always a result of breaking the law, then that means you, have to, you believe you have to keep the law in order to be saved which is no longer grace, which is no longer just faith. It's faith plus obedience to the law. 1 John chapter 5 spells out, these are things that I believe are essential. You have to believe in order to be saved. People say, well, what exactly do you have to believe? Well, it's not very complicated. It's very simple. 1 John chapter 5, verse number 10, the Bible says, He that believeth on the Son of God hath the witness in himself. He that believeth not God hath made him a liar, because he believeth not the record that God gave of his Son. You're saying you either believe God or you don't. Just like anybody, you either believe, if, if someone's telling you something, you either believe them or you don't. If you don't believe what you're being told, then you're saying that that person's lying to you. Right. And that's, a, that's just a cold, hard fact. Yeah. 
You might not want to think about it in those terms. It might not sound real nice. Oh, no, no, I'm not saying you're lying. Yeah, but you don't believe me. You're not believing what I'm saying. If you're not believing what I'm saying, then you must think I'm lying. I'm not actually telling you the truth. And this is what I say about God. Hey, God gave a record of his son. We have that record right here in God's word. You either believe it or you don't. And if you don't believe it, you're making God a liar. So well, it's not really eternal because you could lose it if you do. You're making God a liar. Well, it's not really a gift. I mean, you have to do something for it. You can't just do. You're making God a liar. Right. Well, you know, you're following Jesus. Someone else is following Buddha. Someone else is following Krishna. Someone else is. And we're all gonna go to the same place. You're making God a liar. Amen. Verse number 11, this is the record. So you say, if you don't believe the record, you're making God a liar. Verse number 11, he's saying, this is the record. That God hath given to us eternal life, and this life is in his Son. He that hath the Son hath life, and he that hath not the Son of God hath not life. These things have I written unto you that believe in the name of the Son of God, that you may know that you have eternal life, and that you may believe on the name of the Son of God. Verse number 13, I love that because it just clearly says, hey, you can know you have eternal life. It's not a question. There's no doubt about it. Right. It's not, well, I don't know. I'm trying. No, I have it. I have eternal life. And verse number 11, verse number 11 there's three things mentioned there that if we don't believe, we're making God a liar. Those three things are, number one, God hath given. Given means it's not earned. Given means it's a gift. Given means it's grace. Given means it's not a reward for what you've done. It's given. Right. Number two, what has he given us? Eternal life. Not temporary life, not conditional life, eternal life. Right. That's what he's given us. It lasts forever. And number three, and this life is in his son. The only way to get this life is through Jesus Christ. The only way. The way, the truth, and the life. That is it. If you don't believe all three of these things, you're making God a liar. Amen. And you're not saved. Right. And this is my go-to verse to show people because you will get people who are, are really wrapped up in their religion, whatever religion that may be, and they say, well, no, I mean, I believe that Jesus Christ died on the cross and rose again. And they'll say that. So, what, so how can you say I'm not saved? Because you're making God a liar when you say it's not eternal. Right. This is one of those essential things that a person must believe in order to be saved. And that's why we spend a lot of time on this. And once a person finally understands the concept of eternal life, then I believe they can grasp the gospel. Because the gospel is that Jesus paid it all. He either paid it all or he only paid part of it. You know, is the payment enough? Of what he did. If, if it is, hey, it's eternal. It's done. It's bought and paid for. You're redeemed. You're saved. With a D at the end. Done. Bought. Purchased. In his hand. Forever. Or, well, yeah, what he did was good. And yeah, it's enough to save you. <coughs> But then you need to start doing stuff in order to keep it. You know, then it's, it's not enough to fully save you. Because then, if what Jesus did was enough to save you the first time, right? Is it not enough then to cover your future sins after you've been saved? It, just, it, just, it really doesn't make sense. Nothing I could do that's good was enough, would be enough to pay for my sins up until salvation, but then all of a sudden now they're good enough. Now my works are good enough. It makes no sense. It's not even logical. Now, in order to illustrate eternal life, I use personally two main illustrations. And just like anything else, we don't need to beat a dead horse and just continue to add and add. And add. We want to emphasize eternal life, but once they get it, they get it. But make sure they get it first, right? So I usually start with one illustration and then see if they get it from there. And if they don't get it from there, I'll go to the next one. And if they don't get it from there, I'll go to the next one. There are many ways to explain eternal life to people, 
the two I use, uh, and, and I actually use different illustrations with different people. Again, this is something I've gained through experience. When you have someone who's younger, someone who's a child or you know, like a teenager or a young adult, maybe who doesn't have any children of their own, they don't have a family, I always rely on the gift illustration. Hey, it's a gift, you know, and you just go in all the ins and outs of explaining a gift. You don't have to, if it's a gift, it's free, you don't have to pay for it. You like receiving gifts, don't you? Yeah, it's great because someone else bought it, I just have to take it, right? All these different things about receiving a gift. Now, anyone, of course, could understand that, but usually younger people have been probably more recently receiving gifts and stuff for Christmas, for birthdays, for things like that, and it's going to connect with them even more than someone who, I mean, once you get to be older, it's like you don't really think about gifts a whole lot. You're not thinking about receiving gifts. Like, I'm not thinking about gifts I'm going to get for my birthday. Right? I'm not thinking about gifts I'm going to get for Christmas. It's not even a thought. I think more about giving gifts than I do about receiving them. But when you're younger, man, hey, man, I want that gift. I want <laughs> awesome. It's Christmas time. Yeah, I'm going to get some gifts. Right? Or my birthday is coming up. And that's exciting. So that is an illustration that's going to probably bring home with, with people that age a little bit easier. True. But when it comes to people who have children, they have families, I love using being born again as the illustration, having that new birth, being a child of God, being in that family, that once you're born into that family, you can never be taken from that family. I mean, that's it. Your child is your child forever, and you're always going to love your child. And parents understand the love that you have for a child, that it's unconditional. You love your child. I'm going to love my child no matter what. I mean, as soon as they're born, boom, there's this amazing love that you have for your child that is indescribable. You love them. You want what's best for them. You may be disappointed in them. They may need to be punished. They may need to be disciplined, but you're always going to love them. And nothing can change the fact that their blood is your blood, that their DNA is your DNA, that they're a child and they're a child forever. People understand that illustration. So I like that, you know, especially people with families, and I'll use that illustration too because that will help it click. Yes, a son, a child. Like, oh, so you mean once I believe that's when I become a child? That's when I believe, you know, yeah, that makes sense. So we're helping people to understand that. And that's why we go into illustration. But once you give an illustration and, and, and you think they get it, good. You don't need to give all of the illustrations of, of, of what it takes, you know, of, of explaining eternal life. They get it the first time, they get it the second time, continue on. Now, always ask questions, you know, use an example to see if they understand eternal security. And Every once in a while, normally these illustrations, you've got someone who's paying attention, you've got someone who's following along, you've got someone who's with it, and they're not really you know, opposing what they're, they're hearing. They're receiving it pretty well. Most people, once that light bulb goes on, they understand it. It's pretty good from there on out. But every once in a while, you might think that the, the light bulb goes on and it really doesn't go on. So what you need to do then, and what I always like to do is after after I'm getting I'm getting ready to wrap things up, right? And I think I've done a pretty good job of explaining things. Now it's time to start asking the questions and recapping what you've already gone over, just to make sure you hit it. Because you might think that they got something maybe a little bit faster than they actually did. So ask the question and get the answer. Again, this goes back to engaging the person. So. You know, we've talked about this before. You, you believe you've sinned, right? Yeah, of course, I've sinned. Do you believe that the punishment for that sin is hell? It's you know, however you say it, just, just, yeah. And a lot of times I'll, I'll, because sometimes people get confused, say, without Jesus, where would you go? Because you're a sinner, if, if you didn't have Jesus, where would you go? Go to hell. Good, they understand that point. Next point, right? And just recap everything. And I'll say, okay, I've got an example for you. Let's say you've got a person, they hear all this stuff today. They didn't know about Jesus before. They hear and they decide, you know what? I want to be saved. 
and they put all of their faith in Jesus Christ. They call it to God, to God, please save me, I want to be saved. And I always ask the question, would that person be saved? Direct question. If they say, well, I don't know. So, apparently I wasn't very thorough. Well, I asked him, would that person be saved? And now I'll say, well, what, what does the Bible say we have to do to be saved? Because you should have already spent plenty of time on that. And if they still don't quite know, or if they think, well, I don't know, it's, you know, either, you either have to go back and go through it again, or you just cut the time, because if you feel like you've really exhausted the subject and they're just not getting it, that might not be their day. Right? Like I said, I want to invest the time, but some people, it's just, they're just not going to get it that day. And you're, you're planting seeds and watering seeds, but it just might not happen that day. And, and you know, when you, when you run out of things to say, like, well, I, I don't know what else, how <laughs> to explain it. That's okay. Right? It's okay. Just, just move on. And, and point them to a video. Point them to something. You know, leave them with a YouTube card or our invitation. And say, hey, when you get some more time, you know, think about this stuff, watch this video later. So you get another, another opportunity. But they say, oh, yeah, no, that, that person would be saved. Great. Okay, they got the answer right. They've been listening. What if that person, you know, today they put their faith in Jesus, they get saved, right? Well, 10 years later, you know, I usually give some type of illustration. And it doesn't have to be super crazy, but um, you kind of give, like, they do this sin and this sin. You know, they get drunk, they get in a car wreck, they kill someone else, and they end up dying. Or sometimes I'll use an illustration of they committing suicide or whatever, right? Something that's pretty bad. Bad enough that if you just asked your average person, they'd probably say, well, that person's going to hell. Because they did something that they should go. Now I don't go. Don't go down like the child molester path and stuff like that. We don't want to get involved in explaining reprobates to people and, and whatever, unless you absolutely have to. We we don't. We, we try to just avoid that stuff. But just you know, someone kills someone. They do all this other stuff, whatever. Just to make sure they understand. Because when you understand eternal life, you know it lasts forever. If you've done a good job explaining that, they'll be able to say, well, they're going to heaven. Because they believe. And, I, and I'll ask why. So say, you know, I give the example and they say, well, where is that person going? Heaven or hell? If they say heaven, I say why? Why are they going to heaven? And they'll usually, if they say the answer, they'll usually say, well, because they believe. Or something along those lines. If they say hell, I go, why? Well, he committed all these sins. Well, what does the Bible say? You know, and, and the point, again, is to get them thinking. To get them engaged. And you may need to go through another example at that point if they didn't understand. All of this said to just say, be thorough with your presentation and, and be thinking about it. And choose your words carefully. When I use the hypothetical examples, I think it's way better to use a third person. Because for a long time I used the first person. Like I said, well, what if you were to do this? What if you were to do that? I've had a lot more people in those situations say, well, no, I'm still saved, but still didn't really understand eternal life because in their minds they're thinking, well, I would never do that. Instead of even allowing for the concept of the hypothetical, well, what if I did? They're just saying, well, I'm never going to do that. Right. So they're going to say, well, no, I'm still I'm saved because, you know. I always like saying, well, what if there's a just... Some random person, I like using my imaginary friend. We got an imaginary person, he's been saying here, God sees his heart, you know, all this stuff. It's easier for someone to cast judgment on someone else than it is on themselves. So just if you're gonna use an example illustration like that, avoid putting everything on that person. Well, would you go you know the third person is is a great example. Because you could get an honest answer on that person and, and um one last point I just want to make. When you wrap it all up, you recap with questions. And even throughout the presentation, let them answer. Okay, because I've seen this happen before too. Don't answer the question for them. Don't lead them so much when you're asking them the question that you're basically just giving them the answer while you're asking them. 
that's not going to do any good at all. All you're going to do is have people repeat and not fully understanding, did they really get this? Avoid that. And this is difficult. Now, I've probably seen this happen more often than most of the other things that, that we've went over this morning. This is one of the big things. I've seen it happen even in this church. And um, you know, don't lead that much. If you ask the question, you, the whole point is to get them to think. And, ma- and, and you know what? If you've got to wait a minute or whatever, let them answer. That's how you're going to know what's in their heart. So allow them to give you that, that, that honest answer and continue from there. Because at the end of the day, we don't get to see anybody's hearts. We can just go based off of what they say. And that's it. So allow for them to give you what they believe. And that's, that's going to be how, we're gonna, you know, how you're going to know where you need to spend the most time on when you're giving the gospel to people. So I am excited for all the work. So please, again, I, this isn't meant to be a wet blanket. It's meant to just self-analyze and improve. Let's always be focusing on what can I do more to improve my soul winning technique. What else can I learn? You know, memorize scripture. Do other. There's a lot of things you can do along the way to help make you more proficient at, at leading people to Christ. But let's all always be thinking, what more can I do? And not just having the attitude of, I am the ultimate soul winner. Right? Let's bow our heads have a word of prayer. Dear Heavenly Father, Lord, we thank you so much for um, the free gift that you've offered unto all of mankind, dear Lord, by giving the ultimate sacrifice of your only begotten Son, Jesus Christ. Lord, I pray that you would please just help us I mean, we're, we're earthen vessels, Lord, and uh, we're sinful and we're not perfect and we don't have all knowledge and perfect understanding of all your ways, dear Lord, but we do know what it takes to be saved and you've made that very easy and very simple for us. God, help us to make the gospel easily understood and, and um, can speak plainly with people and not, not be confusing, but just keeping it... it nice and simple the way that you made it Lord help us to become better soul winners we want to reach people we love people dear Lord Um, help us to continue to improve Lord bring to our our mind and our remembrance and um, your scripture your words and uh, point out the areas where we're lacking and where we're failing and where we can improve Lord to help us uh, do better we're we're here for you we're offering up ourselves uh, as ministers To do your work, God, we need your guidance and your help. It's in Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Amen.